Hey guys, it's Roderick. I'm here with Feud Capote versus the Swans, Season 2, Episode 5, The Secret Inner Lives of Swans. So, here we go. So this episode really kind of left me feeling some sort of way, right? Like when I first saw the preview with a little kind of thumbnail and I saw there's James Baldwin, I was like, mm, this better not be some magical Negro-ish, okay? If you don't know what a magical Negro is, you can Google it, there will be a definition there. But I was like, this better not be some magical Negro-ish. So after I start, so I watched the episode and I sat back and this episode kind of was slightly problematic in, a, in three ways, right? The first primary way in which I thought this was problematic was the chronology, right? Because this episode takes place one day after the Esquire episode occurs, right? Now, if you go back to episode four, or which we just saw, we know that this takes place, that the end of episode four takes place several weeks or months after the Esquire episode comes up. So I was like, well, okay, we're kind of doing wonky with the chronology, right? Then I realized who we're dealing with. Now, if you've never watched a Ryan Murphy show recently, I would probably say, because I've been watching Ryan Murphy since Nip Tuck. If you have not watched Nip Tuck, Go back, binge Nip Tuck. It's fantastic. I think it's available on Hulu. Um, but recently, as far as I can say, I'm like, for example, American Horror Story Season 3, one of my favorites, he kind of does this thing where he does two parts in a season, right? So you, instead of coming, typically when you have a, a season or a, a series, typically a season, right? You have your A storyline, which kind of goes all the way through. We have our B storyline, sometimes the C and then typically a C and then sometimes a D. They all kind of intersect and merge around episode four or five. And then we kind of come to our climax around seven. And then we have our resolution around on, on episode eight, which sets us up for our next season, right? What Maya Murphy typically does is he will give you two, so really like two different sets of story, like two different A storylines within the entire season. Because remember when I asked you all whose story was this? right? Because at the end of season four, you really felt like, okay, this whole narrative had kind of like they buttoned this all up because we got the, really the relationship between Truman and Babe and kind of the fallout from this. And then, you know, Truman and Bathhouse, you know, Bathhouse trade and Truman and Jack and then all the other swans. And now we seem like we're entering into the second part of what this narrative is, what this narrative is, right? Think about American Horror Stories, right? So when the young little um, witch shows up, you got the witches showing, you got the witches there in New Orleans. They're being hunted by witch hunters. Fiona's there, she's a supreme. Cordelia's the headmistress. We meet all the different witches there. We go through, we got Kathy Bates and her racist ass. Then we know that um, Marie Laveau is in town. But the main storyline is the witch hunters. Then after the witch hunters and Cordelia and Cordelia goes blind, we switch to a second set of we switch to a second narrative of Fiona's dying. She's gonna you know we need a new supreme. Who's gonna be the new supreme? And then all this other stuff going on, right? So that's kind of like how we end up having like two parts in the same season, and that is really what this episode really felt like, right? Is that it was like two parts within the same season, and it just kind of felt like I like the first part. The first part with Truman being messy and and whatever and you know, and, and like all the swan fallout that was good, right? But what they're attempting to do here, I thought was a little interesting, right? Because the way in which the story goes, they kind of want us to feel a kind of bad for Truman, right? And then we start to get some some revelations that seem kind of incongruent with what the Truman that we originally met and the and the Truman that we see at the end of episode four doesn't match the Truman that we meet here because this Truman is the Truman before we meet him at the end of episode four. So this is kind of why we start to say kind of wonky. The next thing that's problematic, and it's not want to say problematic because it's a double-edged sword. You can't talk about wanting representation and diversity in te television and films and then get upset at which how they used, right? Um, I thought that I, you know, James is more, more probable, it's probably probable that James Baldwin and Truman Capote had a relationship. It's highly probable that what happened in this episode really happened. But the way in which kind of, and, and this is maybe kind of true of how kind of black people show up, you know, show out, kind of want to fix your problems or whatever. I just always am like, mm, okay, right? But the truth is they are friends. They, and as we get into the, as we get into the reveal, I'll kind of be like the parts that raise my eyebrows. 
but I'm just kind of like, it just, I mean, I won't say it was wholly magical Negro, but it was right on the border of mag some that magical Negro-ish. So, but overall, y'all know I'm in, for, in with this show. I like it. I'm into it. But enough ado, let's get into the ish, okay? So, like I said, this, this episode starts off in 1975. It's the day after the Esquire episode, and Babe is beside herself. She's still reading the article. Bill is upset. And then they, and Bill is like, well, what do we ever do to him, right? Like, what do we ever do to him to cause him to make us do, to make him like kind of out us, whatever, instead of open the doors and give him and allow him to be in places that typically he would not be able to get into, right? And then Babe, of course, is upset. Truman calls, the, 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 phone, a phone, the phone rings, it's Truman. And Bill just wears him out. He was like, you're going to die alone. You're the, you know, don't you ever call here again. I can't believe you. We're going to destroy you. Boop, 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 right? So now I'm like, well, okay, that seems like a natural reaction after Bill himself had got all his business sprayed all over Esquire. So Truman, like, starts taking pills and he's, like, having, like, whiskey smoothies. And I'm just kind of like, again, how did you really think that this was going to work? Right? Like, the, I don't understand how you could think of outing your friend's personal business is going to make them, like, understand, right? Nevertheless, we don't really find out why. Now, I will say, I believe, as we go into this, that this episode is an attempt to explain why Truman did what he did. At least, I think it may be a red herring of an attempt. I mean, I don't think I'm buying it as we get into the as we get into the recap. But I think that this episode tries to set the foundation of why Truman did what he did and whether or not his expectations on his friend's reaction was realistic or not. I'll just go ahead and say that, right? So anyway, the phone rings as Hina wakes up the next day. It's James James Baldwin. We call him Jimmy. So he's like, "Come meet us in the Cote Basque." He's like, "Oh my God, I'm going to be shiny." He's like, "Bitch." Come on, we got stuff to do, right? So Truman shows up and they are staring him down. They are icing him down. They're just giving him the stares. Like, I don't know which was worse to him or the Ann Woodward stares. Like, they were all just really icing him down. So then Jimmy's like, look, a library's in session. We got some hard truths to talk about. So you better buckle up because this is what he's doing, right? And the first thing is like, why is James Baldwin doing this, right? Literally, as I'm writing, like, why is James Baldwin doing this? He, James, the character tells us. It's like, he goes, well, if you look at all the other different minority groups, they all have a community. Blacks, women, Jews, but us gays have to stick together. And there's not that many of us out there who are doing it. And so I was like, okay, this, you know, this makes sense. Of course, I'm thinking if the roles were reversed, would Truman Capote be coming Captain save a for James Baldwin? I think not. But we're just going to suspend disbelief because this is a work of fiction and just, you know, chalk it up to whatever, right? But I don't think that Truman Capote would be Captain save a So then what we get into is kind of like Truman starts to reveal his true disdain for the swans and really how they live these lives of privilege, of class, you know, that is of this undercurrent of race that he finds disdainful. Now, that seems, that seems, you know, true. But my problem then is, is that, again, remember my story. Remember what I'm telling you when you're ever watching a work of fiction, especially television or film, don't trust the narrator. The reason I find Truman's narration about his, about the inner lives of the swans, while they may be truthful, his disdain I find is specious because you were enjoying the fruits of that. Where was all this disdain and all this discomfort and all this disgust while you were fool la line, twirling around at the parties, drinking champagne, being the hit? You know, like, I just, I didn't see that. So it's kind of like that, you know, we ever see those, those bank robber movies where three people decide to rob a bank and there's always one person who decides, oh, I can't do this, I can't rob the bank, this goes against my conscience. I hate that person in the bank robber. I like the two people who are 10 toes down that we are going to Bonnie and Clyde this and rob the bank. I don't like the third wishy-washy or the third who's okay with the planning of robbing the bank. You're okay going into the car to rob the bank and then you're okay with pulling your gun out but all of a sudden somehow in the bank heist you decide that this goes against something of some moral faction of yours that has not been revealed. And I just don't like that. I find that to be very, again, specious, right? So that's kind of where this taste is leaving me. So he goes, okay, 
he was like, so Truman's like, why are you asking me all these questions about the swans? And James Bowman goes in and talks about, you know, the truth is all the different types of swans really don't like each other, right? And he goes to the different types of swans and why don't they like each other? And he's like, well, okay, then fine. So he starts talking, so he starts to, so now we enter these inner lives. And he's like, you know, babe. And then, you know, he talks about how really the, the intention was not to hurt the swans, but really to out the men. And he gives the example of how he's over at Babe's and then Bill, Bill and Babe are arguing back and forth. And Babe, you know, Bill is again embarrassing the dog fuck out of Babe again. And he's like, I wanted to embarrass the men. I wanted the men to see how horrible they were being and not really hurt the women. And I was just like, okay, let's say I believe that, right? And then we find out that all the men are trash, right? The CZ's husbands are flirting with the help and how the swans just all really put up with it. And then... We get to see him having it lunch. And Lee is bitching how Lauren Bacall took her look. And Truman says that the women cheat just as bad as the men. Then I gagged, right? And I was like, okay. So, oh, also part of Babe's anger at Truman was the fact that there were certain people that he did not, that he did not um, include, right? Like Lee, he said that Lee came, that Lee and Gloria Vanderbilt, and then there's somebody else, they all came out unscathed, but he didn't do that. Now, let's be clear, okay? Lee, as we recall, right? Yes, really slim. Yes, Lee is the, is the sister of the First Lady of the United States. He knew better than to, keep, than to put Jackie O's sister in his mouth, right? Because that would have caused a whole, whole, whole lot of problems. Recall that Truman may play stupid, he ain't really stupid. So that pretty much is why Lee, and plus Lee is on top of her game getting MVP status season episode after episode. And I think that he would have found himself in a whole lot of trouble trying to spray, uh, spray Lee's business. But let's go back. So let's continue. So he's saying the women are just as sleazy as the men. Cheating. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, oh my God. He was like, Lee's out there slinging puss. Slim is out there slinging puss, right? And I was like, what in the world? He called Slim, what was the word he looking for? A truly a slattered. Look that word up. It is going in my vocabulary. And then we find out that Babe is out here dressed, is dressing up as pirates for, for a little delivery boy trade. And I was like, oh my God. And I was like, and see, this is another thing I didn't like, right? I feel like this whole episode should be called Mad Day, right? Because, you know, Mad Day is when you, you tell a friend a secret, they know all your business, and then one day they get mad and tell all your business to somebody else. That's what this episode felt like. Because the fact is, if they were truly your friends or you really truly cared about them, like we saw you crying and boohooing and sending flowers and telegramming all in episode four, why does it all, why are you out here just telling all their whole ass business like that just unabashedly? So I was like, okay, right. Then he even says that CZ calls her the human chastity belt. I almost fell out. He was like, even her has, she's had her balances, right? And he's like, it's a double standard because when the men cheat, they have to give the women jewelry. But when the women cheat, he was like, they get nothing. And he used the example of how Slim had a whole, put her husband in another bedroom and then ran men up and down through her bedroom all the time. And the husband knew. And he's like, the only revenge that men have is fucking around with, with younger women. And that's the thing in which, that's the one kryptonite of the swans is them is younger women, right? Because they are really scared. Because that's how you get replaced is a younger, better version of you, right? So then... Truman leaves the table and he says he's going to throw up. But child, he's really trying to call babe again. And I was like, okay, how were we five seconds ago telling all of their business, but yet you're calling babe to say you're sorry? And I'm like, eh, okay, whatever. But that's kind of the human condition, right? We do things, but then we come back, right? So then, but I'm still not feeling sorry for Truman at this point, right? So Jimmy asks, why did he leave all of that out? And Truman says... <laughs> that he was not trying to kill them, but they really are trying to kill him, right? So then he was just, and then they start getting into this really kind of discussion about the subtle racism and classism that exists within the higher, the high society of the Upper East Side, blacks for service, homosexuals for entertainment, you know, the whole thing and how he couldn't really bring Jack to any of the events because Jack was, it, was, it would have been too overtly homosexual and then 
you know, and, and, and they give an example of how Lee gets the girls in formation to kind of boycott Bianca Jagger from dinners. Like, they're like, you know, they're like, she's okay, you know, for dinner parties, but do you really want her sitting at your table? Now, if you Google or Wikipedia Bianca Jagger, the, 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 you will find out that she is the wife of Mick Jagger, and she's also Argentinian, right? And I don't think she's a white passing Argentinian either. So that is kind of his example of like the subtle racism, right? But I'm just like, well, all this bigotry again was fine, Truman, when you were on, when you were reaping the benefits and you're talking about how Lee, how Babe wants to buy you a house and you're sitting on private planes. But now all of a sudden, since you don't, cr you don't, you don't cross them, you're somehow getting some kind of moral conscience. It just really just didn't sit right again, right? So then they go to a museum and Truman asks if he's in love and Jimmy says no. And then Truman's like, well, why didn't we ever date? And he's like, two flowers and no gardener. That is a very important life point. If you are a flower, if you're the person that wants to, that likes to have all the attention, that kind of has self, you know, aggrandizing moments, you have to be with a gardener, somebody who's willing to water you, who's willing to ground you, who's willing to take care of you. Two flowers without a gardener ends up a bad relationship. Haas put it in this terms. Two selfish people can't be in a relationship, right? Because the entire relationship is all about transaction. Right? So that's the life lesson from there. If you know you're a self-centered, selfish person that wants things to be all about you, then you have to then you're gonna have to date someone who is a generous and kind and loving person who loves you for yourself and who's not as selfish and self-centered as you are. So they so that's what Jimmy's thing is like, girl, we would have killed each other because I would have put up with none of your bullshit. So that's kind of why we never dated, right? And then Truman goes in and says, like, how the swans are really dull, how they don't read anything. And then he was saying this, the story he used that, like, you know, Lee wanted to be an interior designer, but she really couldn't be an interior designer because she didn't, like, take orders from other people. So in the scene, girl, she's picking out drapes, and the woman's like, this is not what I thought. And Lee is like, bitch, if you say one more word to me about these motherfucking drapes, she's like, what the fuck you want me to do? Go back to the garment district, get you some more drapes, have them cut and put these drapes back on. And the woman's like, this ain't what I asked for. And Lee's like, this is what you gonna get because I ain't getting you no more drapes. So clearly Lee's interior design life really didn't, didn't, um, didn't really long go that, go that well. So then he also goes about how the swans are two or horrible mothers because they're too self-centered and how see how CZ talks about she never sees her kids. She's like, of course I see my kids. We go fox hunting and then we see the scene with Babe with her daughter at the birthday party and all the kids are having fun except for Babe's daughter who's sitting on the couch next to her mother. Babe is whole ass drunk. She was like pissed because she's like, what the hell are carnations? I said chrysanthemums. She's pissed about the flowers. The daughter is not having fun. The clown that almost knocked over his, knocked over the vase. She's like, oh, that's it. Get this buffoon out of my house, girl. Send your friends home. She stumbles up. And she, and, you know, and this was a really good scene because from what we know about Babe, it's all about perfection. And being a mother is not, is the opposite of perfection because you're an imperfect person raising an imperfect person in an imperfect world. So babe in her world of trying to keep everything perfect is just crumbling under the pressure. Girl, she tumbles up in the shower. She, the water's all falling on her. Naomi, Naomi Watts needs to be Emmy nominated for this, for this season, right? For, for this season, for, for this season. This is a fantastic, she is, she is killing it. And her and Demi Moore are killing it episode after episode after episode, right? So then, Jim is trying to explain to you that art is really about revenge, right? It's about you telling, taking that inner anger and that inner hatred and everything that is within you and trying to make it something. And Truman's like, you know, I really, you know, um, you know, oh God, envy, that's what I'm looking for, painters, because they can take their work and make it abstract and leave the meaning to be subjective as opposed to writers where your words are on the you are right there on the screen and there's a very little wiggle room for people to kind of to and to see what you mean with your words or whatever like that, right? So then Truman's all like, oh my God, okay, I need a drink. And then literally Truman's like, look, bitch, you are alcoholic, you drink too much. All this drinking is ruining your gift, okay? But since I'm not here to judge because I got my own problems too, we'll go out and get a little drink, two drinks only. I was like, okay, Mother Teresa, Magical Negro. So they get two drinks, right? So then 
you know, they go to a gay bar, which of course, you know, whatever. So they're in their key can at the gay bar. And then Jimmy apologizes. So Truman apologizes to Jimmy for being unkind about some of the things he said. And Jimmy was like, mm, some of that was true. And you know what? I apologize if I said some untrue things about you, right? Because he goes, true, he says, criticism only hurts if it's true, right? So then Truman's like, this is the problem with the swans. They're not, they would never be loyal to people like that because they're constantly trying to compete with each other. So then we get this another scene with Jimmy Moore and Ann Wood. So we get Ann Woodard again, right? So Lee and Babe are sitting at the table, their regular table. They got some empty seats. And Woodard comes in. It's like, you know what? I was supposed to meet blah, blah, blah here. And he has stood me up. Is it okay if I sit down? And Lee's like, oh, no, girl. You can't sit with us. Like, it gave you total 1960s mean girls, right? <clears throat> and she was like, this is what you, Babe was like, this is how the formula for what you do. You go home and write him a note, and while you're eating your sad soup and sandwich, you write him a note, but you can't sit down with us. So then Anne sits down anyway, and she goes, so what you're telling me is that I should go home and write a note and eat my sad-ass super salad because I can't fucking sit with y'all? And Lee's like, girl, I wouldn't have said that, but you know what time it is. And Babe was like, bitch, you can't sit with us. And Anne is just aghast. Now, here is the, I, this is the ironic part of this, right? If you recall, right, when Truman had done Anne so wrong in the earlier seasons, I think it was season, in the episode one, they were all trying to run and ride for Anne. When Anne unalived herself, they were like, blah, 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 Anne. You weren't really fucking with Anne, right? And you wouldn't even let Anne sit at your table. See, this is how they let, this is how the whole narrative changes because they were acting like Anne was their girl, but they wouldn't even, they were really fucking with Anne. So I was like, girl, whatever, right? Anyway, so I was like, they, and he then says like how the swans despise growing older. And then he was saying how, you know, then we get the scene of like Lee looking in the mirror, looking at her face and we get like the little close-ups of her like face of surgery or whatever like that. And then Truman and Works admits that he has had, he had some work done because at a dinner party, Lee brings up Bill Blass and how great he looks. And then Lee just kind of reads him for filth, being like, girl, you look, if I see you on TV, you're looking weathered, you're looking fat, you may need to get some work done. And I'm just only telling you because we don't have basic broke dumpy bitches rolling with us, so you need to get your shit in formation. Which I can honestly kind of respect, right? Like, we got a crew, we got a look, we got a thing. And if you're going to be our gay plus one, whatever, get in formation. And I was like, mm, okay, it's not right, but it's okay. So I was just like, whatever, right? So then, yo, Truman also says how the swans don't eat. And we see the thing of them cut and move together. I call it the L.A. plate shuffle. If you ever go out to dinners with people in L.A., a lot of people, like, especially in the entertainment industry, they don't eat. They just kind of shuffle food around. And you see that they do the same thing. They shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. They cut, cut, cut. They shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. They talk. They drink. They shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. And then they put one bite in their mouth. And then you see how Lee does a little, mm, and then, like, you see her hiding the food. So, girl, I mean, as I told my gay friends a long time ago, I don't make the rules. I just live by them. So I was like, girl, if this is what you have to do to be to be the top bad bitch, then don't eat. Like, I'm not mad at them. I was like, whatever, right? So then finally, Truman's like, okay, let's have another drink. He's like, bitch, no. I told you two drinks. Two drinks are what it is. Now we getting the fuck up out of here, right? So then <clears throat> we get back to Truman's place. And, you know, he's like, oh, give me some grapefruit juice. And they're eating grapefruit juice or whatever like that. And then... We hear Truman go to the kitchen and we hear open a bottle and pour. He's like, Jimmy, I need some vodka. And Jimmy grabs a thing, grabs it, grabs the um glass and throws it up against the window. And then we have the ultimate come to Jesus, right? He's like, look, these swans here, your job, your purpose on earth for the for the few moments you are here is to bring light to darkness. You need to stop letting these swans, these swans crush your spirit and finish the work you need to do. All this drinking bullshit you're doing is bullshit. Why are you doing drinking? I'm in pain. People leave me. Jimmy's like, P bitch, everybody got pain. Put it in your words. Put it into writing. Tomorrow morning, put on you a sweater. Get you a bacon, egg, and cheese from New York Jelly, which if you've never had one of those, they are fabulous. Get you a bacon, egg, and cheese. Get you a cup of coffee and finish the work you got because tomorrow is not promised. Now, was that very magical, Negro-y? Very much so. But did it buttonhole the, 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 the episode? Absolutely. Do we also see the point of what's happening? 
Absolutely, right? So, I mean, you, you, it's a double-edged sword. I thought it was a great scene. It definitely is some weak to magical negroness, but I was just like, whatever, right? So then Truman goes to bed, no pills, no booze, and then finally he gets a phone call. It's Jimmy. He's at the airport. He's going back to Paris, and he goes, I forgot to tell you one more thing. There aren't a whole lot of swans in England, right? All the swans in England are owned by the queen, right? And if you ever watched The Crown, you would have seen from this past season how she has an official royal swan person. So, and how the reason they're very extinct because the kings and queens of England used to eat them and serve them in big buffets and big feathers and whatever like that. I just wanted to leave that with you. So now we get the final scene and Truman wakes up, he makes his coffee, he starts to write. And then we find out that somebody named Maddie is, he goes, all right, we hear some clinking. And literally, I know, tell me I was not the only one whose heart stopped. was like, girl, is bathhouse trays there? Like, if we go into some bathhouse trays shit, child, it's somebody named Maddie, who's the server at the Tavern on the Green, which is located in Central Park. It's one of the places you have to go to and eat in New York City. Um, just, to, just to say you've been there, because it's, it's good. Um, he's a waiter who wants to be a chef. He has Maddie cooking dinner. We find out that Maddie has fucking stolen a swan from Central Park, killed it, and that is what Truman is eating for dinner, just like the Queen of England. So what does that mean? That is symbolic of the fact that this next arc, our next five, six, or six, seven, eight episodes, or next three episodes, is good about Truman doing his work and really trying to bring down or to attempt to change the social status or the social class of New York City as he was theoretically inspired by James Baldwin. Okay, I, 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 I see that. <clears throat> Excuse me, whether or not that is, I mean, I don't know, it just seems very out of sync, right? Because Truman seems like a very superficial, flighty, vacuous person. And the fact that he was somehow inspired by the works and words of James Baldwin to decide to do this, to finish the book, because he wants to change the social structure and the social standing of, of the New York elite. Eh, okay. I would rather have an episode with him, a whole flashback with him and his mama, about how his mother is treated badly. And that's why he's doing it, right? I thought the mother angle was far better than this kind of like social justice, anti-classism, anti-racism, anti-homophobic, because the fact is, he didn't. it didn't really matter to him while he was reaping the benefits. And I'd rather you just stay on that energy as opposed to acting like you don't have a change. Because we realize he didn't have a change because at the end of the last episode, he was still begging to be back with those bitches anyway. So what happened to all that shit that we happen here? That's why this episode just felt very disjointed. I do like the inclusion of James Baldwin. I'm a huge James Baldwin fan. So anyway, I want to know what you guys think. So drop down in the comments. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, share the video with your friends, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.